So good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies at UC Berkeley, the sponsor of today's event, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Harry Potter in Yiddish, translating across languages and cultures. My name is Isaac Lehman. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at Cal and an affiliate of the center. And much of my work focuses on the sociolinguistics of contemporary Yiddish speaking communities. Our guest today is Arun Adela Dishvanat, a gifted young translator who happens to be my cousin. Adela grew up as a native Yiddish Tamil bilingual in New Jersey and currently lives with his family in New York City. He earned his BA in linguistics from Harvard in 2013 and then spent a year in India on a Fulbright. Adela currently works for Instagram on their product growth team um, and is extremely active in the, in the world of Yiddish. Harry Potter und der Philosophische Stein, which I have, which I have right here, um, is not the only literary work Adela has translated into Yiddish. He's also recently uh, translated a Faroese children's book, which will appear later this summer. In addition to his translations, Adela serves on the executive board of the Yiddish Liga, the League for Yiddish. He'll be joined in conversation today by Robert Alter, Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley, where he's taught since 1967. By the latest information I've received, Professor Alter has published over uh, 24 books, including prize-winning volumes on biblical narrative and uh, poetry and award-winning translations of books of the Bible, as well as hundreds of articles and reviews. His completed translation of the full Hebrew Bible with a commentary was published by Norton in 2018 in a three-volume set. In addition to translating, Professor Alter's own works have been translated into 10 different languages. Professor Alter is a member of numerous scholarly organizations and has received prestigious fellowships, including from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, a fellowship he received twice, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. In recent years, he has been the recipient of numerous honorary doctorates and awards, including the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Contribution to American Letters from the LA Times, and the Charles Homer Haskins Prize for Career Achievement from the American Council of Learned Societies. Um, because the audience at today's talk is so large, looks like we're going over 130 um, right now, I ask that you please submit any questions you have during the event using the Q&A button in Zoom. And after the conversation, I'll be able to pose some of those questions to our two speakers. Also, please be aware that the conversation is being recorded and will be posted to the center's YouTube page so you can share it within your social networks. Without further ado, I will hand things over to Professor Alter. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be in conversation with Arun Visniak. Um, I'm going to begin with, with a painfully obvious question. I say it's painfully obvious because I suspect that this has been posed to you many times, which is why the choice of Harry Potter? Say, if you wanted to get um, a distinctive work of uh, English language literature into Yiddish, say, why not do John Updike's uh, Rabbit trilogy or, or um, uh, Margaret Atwood's uh, uh, Alias Grace? So t tell us a little bit about what drew you to Harry Potter. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, to me, the choice is obvious because as a, as a uh, more or less new, uh, a uh, new arrival into the world of literary translation. Uh, I'm glad that I'm not starting uh, with something at, a, at such a high level, but um, for me, Harry Potter is probably the book that defined my childhood. And I'm sure that there is uh, a number of people in the audience who might say the same for themselves. Um, I grew up in a home in uh, the suburbs of New York City where we spoke Yiddish and Tamil. Uh, the Yiddish was uh, spoken by entire mother's side of the family. And uh, we were raised with a sense that it's, it's important and critical for us to acquire this language and engage with this language and ultimately to, to pass it along. And I always felt that there was an acute lack of literature uh, that was that, that that would be interesting to me as a child and then later as a young adult. There were works of 
Yiddish literature uh, for children, uh, either that were published in uh, before World War One or, or between the wars, but those often uh, had a certain tone uh, and a, a certain uh, thematicity to them that I didn't always uh, feel like it spoke to me. And of course, there were works and there are works uh, continuing to be published in the Yiddish speaking Hasidic world uh, of the modern day. And while those have the gloss and the color, um, they are uh, often explicitly moralizing uh, and, and have a religious character. And that wasn't what a kid from uh, Bergen County, New Jersey was particularly interested in. Uh, and so I had always wished that I would have something that, uh, that could speak to me that would be in Yiddish that I could enjoy, uh, seeing as Shalom Aleichem, another classic Yiddish literature, uh, was not particularly interesting to me as a child. So when I was speaking uh, a few years ago with my wife and we were talking about our future and how we want to uh, raise children, she asked me if I was seriously considering bringing children into a world that doesn't have Harry Potter in Yiddish. And so I thought, why not? Uh, let me try my hand at it. And uh, I think there's, there's something, uh, there is, there's an interesting parallel in Harry Potter and certainly the first book of Harry Potter being JK Rowling's uh, more or less first entry uh, into, the, into the world of literature. And you can see how her style evolves as, uh, as the books go on, uh, both in terms of the, the, the themes uh, that are covered in the work, as well as the complexity of the language. So in that sense as well, I thought, let me start with this as, uh, as my first attempt in Yiddish literary translation, and let's see how it goes. Okay, now, what you say leads me to flash back uh, on uh, an experience I had when I was a graduate student at Harvard. Uh, and I'm going to re report this anecdote to you and, and turn it into a question. Uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer came to give a talk. Uh, there was a packed audience. You know, he, he was a very prominent figure at the time. And um, when he finished his remarks, I have no recollection of what he said from this distance in time. A brass young man in the audience said, Mr. Singer, Yiddish is a dying language, so why do you write in Yiddish? And Basheva Singer said, dying, dying, you know, it's sort of dying, but the, we Jews are very stubborn. We keep dying languages alive. Like, uh, it's been 1,500 years since we spoke Aramaic, but we still know Aramaic. I myself know some Aramaic. When I was a young man in Varsha, uh, uh, it was um, uh, uh, Zeitlin, um, not Aaron Zeitlin, but um, the others. The what? His what? Yeah. What? Pardon me? I believe Hill Zeitlin. Yeah. A anyway, so Zeitlin, who was very revered by the young men, uh, wrote, wrote a book in Aramaic. And we came to, we say, why do you write a book in Aramaic? Yiddish, we understand. Polish, okay. Hebrew, all right, but Aramaic? And he says, what? Do you think I write for the ignoramuses? Now, <laughs> I'd like to set that, that anecdote against your launching Harry Potter in, in Yiddish and thinking about potential audiences. There is, there is a certain irony to the development of, of the Yiddish language and its relationship to translation, uh, which to me makes this uh, translation feel in some way part of the golden akate, the golden chain uh, of Yiddish literature. And, um, and that is that the Yiddish language itself has its origins in translation. The, the original name for the language was uh, Yiddish Teich, uh, which literally meant uh, Jewish German. And that was the name for the, the, 
the language which was used to, um, to translate word for word the text of the Torah into a language, uh, into a vernacular that the Jews uh, in the Ashkenazi uh, homeland spoke. Um, and while uh, originally Yiddish Teich meant uh, Jewish German, later on the, uh, the Teich dropped and it just became Yiddish. And Teich came to mean a word uh, that, uh, that means to, to translate, uh, to render. Uh, which may be familiar to some in the audience uh, from the, the pithy saying often attributed to, uh, to a translator of Shakespeare, that his work was fatached and fabesset, yes. uh, translated and improved. Um, so from its very beginnings, Yiddish has been very closely, uh, um, closely in, in conversation with the project of translation. Uh, and of course, uh, in the medieval period, we have the Bava Buch, uh, the Yiddish translation of the Anglo-Norman romance of, uh, of uh, Bovo d'Antona, and uh, which today is known to us in the form of the Bava Misa, the tall tale. Uh, but jumping more to the modern period, when uh, Shalom Aleichem and Mendele and Peretz were uh, stepping out onto the scene in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, around that same time that Yiddish uh, literature as a, as a language, as a native uh, literature for Yiddish speaking Jews was emerging, at the same time, there was a project of bringing world literature to the Yiddish speaking masses. Uh, so works by uh, Jules Verne, um, eight, uh, 20,000 20, leagues under the sea, 80,000. Um, Anna Karenina, all these works being translated into Yiddish for the Yiddish speaking masses. Uh, and now a hundred years later or more, we have a, an English book being translated into Yiddish, uh, as we say, not for the ignoramuses, uh, yeah. but for those who have a very peculiar interest and investment in the Yiddish language. Um, and so I think that in many, in many senses, the, the population, the audience for this book is, is self-selecting. Um, those who are purchasing this book for the most part are, are either native Yiddish speakers uh, or people who have come to Yiddish or are interested in learning Yiddish. And because the text of Harry Potter is so familiar to them, uh, it is serving for them as a way to, uh, to learn Yiddish, even though it is by no means a beginner's text. Um, so the, the audience is largely self-selecting, I would say. Uh, and I'm also very, I, I, I'm very proud when I hear that there are non-Yiddish speaking Jews, uh, but Jews of Ashkenazi of Yiddish heritage who say, I, I'm buying this book. I don't plan on reading it. I don't know any Yiddish, but uh, I'd like it on my bookshelf because uh, it shows where my loyalties lie. And I'm not sure if that, that says something about their loyalty to Harry Potter or to Yiddish or both. But uh, in any case, uh, yes, it's certainly a motley crew. Now, Translation, this is not always the case, can often be a, a, an occasion for linguistic creativity. And I, I will cite one famous example that has to do with the crossover from Yiddish to Hebrew. Mendel um, uh, Forum, uh, that is S.Y. Abramovich, uh, who was a major figure in Yiddish and then Hebrew literature in the latter part of the 19th century and on into the beginning of the 20th century, um, began writing in Hebrew, in Haskalah Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew Enlightenment Hebrew, which was very stilted, very biblical. And uh, after uh, doing that briefly, he felt it just didn't work. So he switched to Yiddish, and as you know, became the, the grandfather of Yiddish literature in so doing. And then for reasons which we needn't go into here, in the late 1880s, he decided to um, switch back to Hebrew. Now, he, he did write some things that were originally in Hebrew. Mostly, it was auto-translation. And what he did 
was actually a spectacular kind of innovation in literary Hebrew, because he found all kinds of strategies as he moved from biblical Hebrew of the Haskalah to uh, basically a kind of uh, rabbinic Hebrew. Uh, he found all kinds of strategies to give Hebrew the liveliness and the richness of a spoken language, even though it wasn't. So in, in uh, your uh, endeavor with, with getting Harry Potter into uh, Yiddish, have you found that, that it, it triggers certain kinds of linguistic innovation? There, um, there is the obvious challenge or opportunity, uh, as one might look at it, uh, that the world of Harry Potter is one of fantasy, uh, very much rooted in the Western European uh, folk tradition and mythology, and yet it is, it is its own unique universe with all kinds of made up gadgets and places and names. Um, and so in, in those places, oftentimes uh, Rowling has in, endowed these names with some sort of sound symbolism or their puns. And in those cases, uh, I suppose uh, you could say the translator's hand is forced. Um, so, you know, what, one example of that would be, um, for example, the, in, in the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, there are four residential houses, uh, one of which is named Slytherin. Uh, and the, the mascot for this house is a snake. And so, and those who are in Slytherin are known to be kind of wily. Uh, and of course, there is, uh, there is a pun in Slytherin on the word Slither. Uh, so I, I couldn't, I, I suppose I could have just transliterated it as Slytherin, uh, but that wouldn't really have uh, that wouldn't really have appropriately rendered what was what was going on behind the scenes. So I eventually settled on uh, keeping the the first sound and keeping the last sound, but changing the middle so that it actually made sense in Yiddish. Um, and what I came up with was Samdirin, which uh, of which the first portion Sam means poison and Dirin means therein. And so Sandirin ends up meaning poison therein. So it doesn't mean slither, um, but it, it does in, in some way convey uh, what the author was trying to get across. But I, that's a sort of very local phenomenon and, and translators can have a lot of fun with that. I think the, the broader question is, what do you do when there is, when there is something systemic to the text um, that requires some sort of overarching solution uh, that, that, that is difficult to, to simply ignore? The one aspect that, that comes to mind was the speech of Hagrid, who is the groundskeeper of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, who is very obviously speaking in uh, some sort of dialect. It's apparent when, when you see the, the dialogue, you see that he's speaking with all kinds of apostrophes, and it's well known among fans that Hagrid speaks some sort of West Country English. So I could have just uh, ignored it and had him speak regularly, but uh, as you say, uh, you were speaking of, of making the text lively. Um, I had no intention of flattening the character of Hagrid. And so I thought, well, if he speaks in uh, dialect in the original, uh, perhaps he should speak in dialect in the Yiddish translation as well. And so uh, I thought what dialect would be, West, would be uh, best suited to a character like Hagrid who is, uh, very warm, um, boisterous, sometimes blustering, uh, has a good sense of humor. And I thought, that's a Galiziana. That's a, that's a Jew from, uh, from, from central Poland, whose Yiddish uh, has certain characteristics. A Galiziana would say, uh, a shine uh, git meidel, uh, a beautiful, good girl. Whereas uh, a Litvak, uh, a Jew from, uh, from Northeastern uh, Ashkenaz territory, uh, would say a good a good a shame in Medo. Um, yeah. Litvaks are known for being a bit more, shall we say, buttoned up, uh, perhaps even severe, um, with a a less yielding sense of humor. And so I gave Hagrid a, a the Galiziana dialect. I had him speak in certain obvious uh, phonetic ways. I had him use vocabulary which is peculiar 
to the to the god sounding mode of speech. And of course, I do employ a caricature, so it's not fully historically uh, accurate, but it's some sort of a composite picture of a god sounding. And then, if Hagrid is speaking god sounding Yiddish, well, we have to bring in some Litvaks somewhere. Um, and so I had uh, some of the other characters who are really quite severe or buttoned up, like Professor Snape or Professor McGonagall, uh, speaking uh, in a in a Litvish Yiddish with a uh, with Litvish uh, uh, syntax and, and Litvish vocabulary. So that was certainly an opportunity to, to have a bit of fun. Um, I actually thought uh, now that we're, we're speaking about uh, the Hogwarts houses, um, maybe this would be a good opportunity um, to just give the audience uh, a sense oh, of yeah. what the book sounds yeah. like. Um, and this, uh, this is another uh, typical opportunity for uh, the translator to get creative is when the, when the original text breaks into poetry or song. Um, so what I'd like to read for you is, uh, is an excerpt uh, from chapter seven. Uh, the chapter is called The Sorting Hat and the song is called The Song of the Sorting Hat. Uh, so this is a magical hat which is placed upon the head of every newly matriculated student at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and the hat uh, proclaims, says Mavinus, uh, about which house uh, each student is going to be in. Um, and I'm just going to say the houses in advance so that those of you in the audience uh, who, who know which house you belong to, when you hear your house, you can silently cheer. Um, so the house of Gryffindor uh, in Yiddish is Golden Griff. Uh, the house of Ravenclaw is Robbenkrell in Yiddish. The house of Hufflepuff in Yiddish is Hufflepuff. And of course, we got the last one already. Slytherin is Samderin, Venom therein. Uh, all right, so I'm going to read one stanza in English and one stanza in Yiddish, and, uh, and we'll see how much you're able to follow along with. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. Sis man punim nishkin shonheit, no de shenkeit gonis zokt. Ge ge fin mir noch a hittel, vos a kop vi meins vermocht. You can keep your bowlers black, your top hats sleek and tall, for I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can top them all. Hey, the kepke, kitschme, kapelich, the streimeloiske pitzte. Such a moichel. Ich bin das, der same kumt zu nutzter. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on, and I will tell you where you ought to be. Der Hogwartser sortierhut, weist an etzem in dein Kern. Du mest machon in Herme Venus, wem die tust gehern. You might belong in Gryffindor where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. The golden griff geherden die mit hearts galant in Dresd. They teilen sich euch mit gewure, otasavos gewure heist. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Geherst die wider Hufflepuff, dem Joischer holds die Teier. Meitz ne stois de horavanje in bestendek agetreier. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, you'll find, or rather, or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you've a ready mind, where those of wit and learning will always find their kind. Bashert zu sein in Robbenkrell is der mit scharfem Sinnen, wie unhängers von Wissen und von Klugschaft sich gefinnen. Or perhaps in Slytherin, you'll find your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. Sie efscher treffst die echte Freien in Samderin dem Chitterin. Wie abi dem Ziel der Grechen sind in Kuscher alle Mitteln. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. Tatimachonit, schreck sich nicht, ich leg auf dir kein Hand, 
Ich bin fort bloß assortiert hat, gar ein freundlich Stück gewandt. Well, that's terrific. Now, um, especially your inventive translation of, of Slytherin uh, leads me to think about something that, that I fiddled with a lot in translating the Bible, which is the, the, the Bible is full of word play and sound play and puns. And puns, sometimes you just throw up your hands in despair. Um, but th th there were certain places where um, it seemed to me the word play was so important that you absolutely had to do something in English with it. And by the way, this is something that, that has never occurred to any previous <laughs> translator of the, the Bible. This is because I'm a literary guy. So for example, it, I'll, I'll just give one tiny example. Uh, in Isaiah 5, uh, it is said of God, I'll, I'll um, first recite the half line in Hebrew. Vayikav le mishpat vihine mispach. Uh, and so referring to God, that, that means, uh, first I'll do it literally. He, um, he hoped for um, uh, justice and, and look um, a blight, which is very flat in English. Uh, and uh, the, the Hebrew, the, the word for justice is mishpat, and the word for blight is mispach. So that's the whole point of Isaiah's line of poetry. Uh, and if you don't create some kind of uh, equivalent in English, you lose the point. So here, I, I wasn't always this successful. I was happy with, with, with this half line. As, and he hoped for justice and look jaundice. But, you know, jaundice is a kind of blight. So, so I, I, I kind of got away with it. Now, maybe, um, Aaron, you could talk a little bit about, um, uh, a, a little bit more about sound play and maybe if there are puns in, in uh, Harry Potter, what, what do you do with those? Sure. Um, well, I guess this is a good time as any to mention that uh, your, your translation of, uh, of the Bible plays a very important role in my weekly reading of the Parsha. Uh, yeah. The tradition teaches that one should uh, do Shnai Mikra Echad Targum, one should read the original twice uh, and translation once. So I do Echad Mikra V'Shnayim Tagum. I read the original, um, and then I read the translation in Yiddish by Yehoyish, uh, and then I read your translation. So by the time uh, by the time I get to yours, I'm I'm really really revved up and excited. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, for your amazing translation. Uh, <laughs> I should also mention uh, that uh, Harry Potter is not the best selling book. In, uh, in the world uh, or in history, because that of course would be the Bible, but it is the best-selling series. Uh, and there are many, many a young person who would swear by Harry Potter. So I'm not sure what that says about <laughs> generation. Um, but um, yes, there, there were opportunities galore for wordplay, uh, for wordplay rather. Um, one, one that comes to mind is um, the, the, the system of currency in the wiz wizarding world is, uh, is quite peculiar. Um, the exchange rate is very confusing, but the, there are uh, three coins. You have uh, the galleon, the golden uh, galleon, the silver sickle, and the bronze uh, nut or knut, and it's spelled K-N-U-T. Uh, and so uh, as a translator, you kind of have, you have a lot of different directions that you could go in. Uh, so I, I thought, well, how do I, is there any opportunity to, to somehow end up with a translation in Yiddish, which not only reflects the sound symbolism, uh, but, also, uh, but also somehow uh, reflects the, the meaning of the item that is intended. Uh, and, uh, and recall that the, the nut or the knut is uh, the smallest unit of currency. It's it's worth uh, something like a few pennies. And so I got to thinking, 
Well, nut in Yiddish is, uh, is a nus or a nissel. Um, and I have this extra K. I'm not sure what to do with that. So um, I considered knissel, uh, but that didn't, that didn't feel, uh, that didn't sit right on my tongue. And so I thought, well, what if we, what if we put the, the K sound, the kif, the kuf? What if we put it in the middle of the word? Um, and that gives us nixel. And uh, the more I thought about it, uh, the more it, it felt right for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that, um, well, of course, it, we keep the K sound, um, but it brings to mind two other words in Yiddish, uh, which, uh, which, which also uh, have an association with small amounts of currency. Uh, the first one is, of course, the nickel, which uh, while it is, uh, it's not, well, the Jews don't have their own currency, uh, but the nickel has long been a part of the uh, of the the, uh, the Yiddish speaking landscape ever since there were Yiddish speaking immigrants uh, to America. And it uh, sounds like a Yiddish word. A nickel. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like a Yiddish word. Um, and there is there is also the word nix, um, which doesn't exist in Eastern Yiddish, but in Western Yiddish, uh, the word nix means not, um, and not as in German, where uh, nix or nichts means nothing. In Western Yiddish, the word meant not. And it happens that in Eastern Yiddish, there is a word nishtel, uh, which would in theory be the, uh, the corresponding word of nixel and nishtel in Yiddish, uh, literally meaning a, a small not, a small nothing, um, actually is what you say when you're, when you're saying that something has absolutely no worth. Um, and so that, that was an opportunity uh, to try to layer on several, uh, several meanings in a word that kind of felt Yiddish. Um, but there's, there, there were also scenarios where um, I, didn't, I didn't feel like I had to do something uh, original in Yiddish, um, and yet it felt like not taking the opportunity uh, would, would somehow be, uh, I, I, I felt like I, I wouldn't be doing justice to the translation if I didn't try. Um, so the one example that comes to mind is the name of the most popular sport in the in the wizarding world, Quidditch, which is a game which is played uh, while zooming about on brooms. Uh, and you have to throw a ball or shoot a ball into a hoop. And uh, Quidditch, of course, one might argue, Quidditch sounds like a good enough word in Yiddish too. Why don't we just call it Quidditch? Um, and I considered that until I remembered uh, this phrase, which I've encountered a number of times in Yiddish literature, uh, most saliently for me in Itzik Manga's uh, satire, of, uh, of Tanakh, his, um, his, his Chinish leader, his songs of the, or poems of the, of the, of the Pentateuch. And uh, in it, he references an old phrase, as Gott will shista bezen. Uh, if God wills it, even a broom can shoot, or perhaps even a broom can, uh, even a broom can bloom, uh, which uh, for the Hebrew speakers in the audience, uh, you might be familiar with the phrase as well, and, um, and I thought, okay, how do we get this quintessential uh, Yiddish phrase meaning anything could happen um, to a context where people are literally uh, zooming about on brooms and shooting balls into hoops. And so I took the word shis, shoot, and basin, broom, and uh, smushed them together and we got shis basin. And uh, I, I, knew that I, had, uh, I, I knew that I had landed on something that worked when uh, a couple of days later, I was thinking about the sport in my head and the word that came to mind was shis basin. And, to me, it felt natural, um, and uh, I hope that the, the readers appreciated the pun, even though uh, one might argue it was a bit unnecessary. <laughs> oh, sounds like fun. I mean, it, it, if a translator doesn't have fun, he's in a bad way, or she is. <laughs> now, uh, I, I'd like to turn our conversation to a, a different challenge of, of translation which is a style and in particular syntax. Now, I was very aware uh, as uh, I've worked on the Hebrew Bible that uh, the way of ordering words in ancient Hebrew removed from us by at least two and a half millennia, taking the average uh, of the dates of composition of, of the books of the Bible, that it's totally different from the way we order words in English. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, uh, the very beginning of um, 
the, the first three words of the Torah, Breshit bara Elohim. Now, Breshit, uh, uh, I'm not original in this. It doesn't mean in the beginning. It means in the beginning of, which you can't quite do in English, but uh, I'd like to focus on bara Elohim, created God which is the normal word order in biblical Hebrew. Uh, first the, the verb and then the subject after the verb. But you can't possibly do that in English. And then of course, the, there's the phenomenon of these parallel structures of syntax, uh, what's called parataxis. Uh, and what do you do with that? What, what I did with this mostly reproduce it. But, um, Th those formal features of the language dictate a certain kind of literary style that we don't have in English. So moving from, from Rowling's English to Yiddish, I would assume there are also differences in characteristic ways of ordering the words in, in what constitutes acceptable literary style. So how did you uh, wrestle with that? I think more than any of these uh, uh, avenues or opportunities for creativity with individual words, um, I struggled much more uh, with, with the tone, uh, not only of, of the dialogue, but of, of the narration itself. Mm. Uh, this is, uh, while while the genre itself is arguably not particularly complex, uh, there is no uh, 1990s young adult fantasy in Yiddish. Right. Um, and the way that uh, the often uh, ironic or, or self-deprecating uh, modes of uh, modes of, of of speech in dialogue and even in the narration, uh, oftentimes were were challenging. To, uh, to render in Yiddish uh, precisely because, well, at least for me, I'm, in, I'm inheriting an idiom which is uh, over time becoming less and less flexible uh, as, as we are removed from the, uh, fr from the milieu where the language was naturally being spoken and developing. And of course, uh, I'm not speaking of the Hasidic community where Yiddish is alive and well and changing uh, and developing, um, I, I oftentimes had to look into a number of different genres to figure out what the, what the right tone was to strike. Um, and sometimes that was going into, uh, into old Yiddish uh, children's literature. Uh, sometimes it was going into, uh, into, uh, the, uh, into plays to get sort of the colloquial style, which in many ways has not been uh, preserved in what we think of as the sort of mainstream Yiddish literature. Um, there, there, there are certainly, uh, in a purely syntactical sense, uh, if this is what you're asking, there are a lot of scenarios where the English feels very comfortable with uh, long sentences, uh, multiple modifiers, uh, oftentimes uh, they are uh, they are verbal participles, past participles, or or current participle or, or present participles. So, uh, running down the stairs, he noticed uh, this item that he had been uh, thinking about putting uh, in this place tomorrow. These sort of long sentences. One could argue that this is um, perhaps uh, a a feature of of a beginner style of writing. Uh, it's not the job of the translator. Uh, to pass judgment on the original, but rather to to render the original as faithfully as possible. So, um, I certainly had to uh, occasionally cut down sentences uh, into uh, into one uh, or or two or, or into two or three or even four sentences. Um, and while on the other hand, uh, there were certainly some cases where I I felt that I had no choice but to yield to the style of the original, even if it didn't feel natural to me in the Yiddish, um, which I think, is, uh, I, I think is acceptable every once in a while uh, as, a way of, as, a, as, a, as a way of almost breaking the fourth wall and saying, I recognize that I'm translating from a genre which is so distant and so far away uh, that mm. 
to, to fully render it into the Yiddish idiom would be losing a piece of the flavor of the original um, that perhaps the, the readers of this translation uh, might, want to, might want to get because they're so familiar with the original. Whereas the audience of 100, 150 years ago who's reading world literature in Yiddish, they don't necessarily care or have an attachment to how the, to how the original uh, is phrased. Right. Whereas today, people feel very loyal to the, to, to the original text. And uh, uh, again, I don't want to draw comparisons to the Bible, but many people have come to me and said, you know, you really should have translated this, you know, this sentence or this word like this, because, um, you know, this is how, this is how it's, it's done in this other context. And so um, the more complaints you have, um, the more you know that it's, that it's striking a chord. And I, I'm okay if sometimes that chord is less than positive, as long as people are engaging with it and engaging with Yiddish and finding, finding um, an entree into the world of Yiddish literature. Uh, even if that starts with Harry Potter, um, hopefully uh, that, that means that they can then delve deeper and continue to build their vocabulary and their appreciation for uh, what we think of as the quintessential classic Yiddish literature. Yeah, it sometimes happens, of course, that a translation by emulating certain features of the source language, which are not native to the target language, uh, can actually introduce a new kind of style into the, the target language. In a way, I think the most famous example in English is the King James Version, which in many ways hewed to the, uh, especially to the syntax of the Hebrew. And um, by doing so, it created a new option for literary English. Uh, and uh, you, you wouldn't have uh, Hemingway, you wouldn't have uh, um, Melville without the King James Version. I was also interested in the fact that, that you, you looked for various uh, maybe unanticipated precedents in Yiddish literature in order to get the style you, you want. And here, I, I didn't do this consciously with the, the translated above, but I think I did it subliminally. For example, uh, a, um, a, a very gifted student of mine who's now teaching at Haifa University, Yosefa Raz, uh, at a kind of symposium of my translation in Jerusalem, said something that never occurred to me. She said, well, if, if you look uh, at uh, Alter's translation of biblical poetry, what you see is a... Um, a clear influence of um, William Carlos Williams, uh, Seamus Heaney, and other modernist poets in English who have uh, worked hard to get English tamped down, concrete, compact. And that's really what, what I, I did and end up doing uh, in. Um, uh, translating biblical poetry, and probably my reading of poets like that uh, seeped into what I was doing. But uh, let me ask you one more, uh, pretty soon we will have to move to the Q&A. Uh, one more general question. Uh, again, I, I see a certain analogy, at least, between your enterprise and mine. But as in translating the Bible, I was translating a whole culture, many of whose practices and assumptions were totally unfamiliar to people living in the 21st century in an English-speaking country. Uh, marriage practices, uh, concepts of family, and, and so forth. Um, I'm sure th this got to you uh, I'm gonna, yeah. You know, I'm gonna finish this question. This is important. Uh, uh, got to you in working with uh, the Yiddish. So, uh, tell me about that. I'll get right back to you. Hello, Juan. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm gonna be uh, on a. I'm doing a Zoom meeting now, and I'll be finished 
I will be finished for about 20 minutes. Can you wait that long? Okay, so, so why don't you come back and I'll pay you. Uh, as your I wonder if maybe, um, maybe I should ask a question from the audience <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah. Um, so the, a lot of questions have come in. Oh, unless. You know, Sorry, do you want to answer the, that previous question? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, would you mind re-asking the question? I, I think I had missed. OK, well, it, it's, it's basically uh, you're translating a text whose whole network of cultural assumptions is radically different from that of the Yiddish world. Uh, and there are all kinds of things in the Yiddish world that have no equivalent whatever in the Anglo world of this writer. Yes, yes. Um, I, well, I think the irony is that uh, the, the pieces that were the most foreign uh, were words for uh, modern concepts, not in the fantasy world, but, but in our, our, our regular world, for which I, I didn't know a Yiddish word. So for example, Harry Potter has a, has a tendency to, uh, to get detention. You know, he'll, he'll go off and uh, have some adventure in the Forbidden Forest and he'll get detention. And I, I looked in all the dictionaries and I couldn't find attention, which of course, uh, you know, make, makes sense, I suppose. It's a, perhaps in, in this uh, form, it's a more recent concept. And so coining words uh, that, um, that correspond to some of those mo more modern phenomena were, um, which uh, ironically is, I think, very closely tied with the, with the Yiddish's project of, mm -hmm. of making sure that Yiddish has the, the tools and the vocabulary to, right, right. to confront the modern world. Um, but there were, of course, uh, there, were, there were scenarios where um, the, the original text is dealing with concepts which for the most part are foreign to Yiddish, uh, like, uh, like Christianity, you know, Christmas is celebrated, people are crossing their fingers, people are praying that something bad won't happen. Um, and while Christmas, of course, uh, most of us know there, there are plenty of words for Christmas in Yiddish, derogatory and neutral. Um, <laughs> how, does one, how does one speak of crossing their fingers in a superstitious sense? Um, how, how do you say, I'm, I'm praying that a troll is not going to come around the next corner? Do you use the word tefillah, um, which is the, you know, the Jewish word for prayer? Do you use the word uh, gebet or gebet, um, which refers to a more neutral prayer, but still feels religious in some way? Um, so, you know, it is... It, it is a word which in, in young adult genre, um, prior doesn't quite mean uh, what, right, what prior right. traditionally means. So that's where I found, uh, I, I found the challenge to be much more interesting, uh, whereas the rest uh, much more easily fell into place. That's interesting. Well, uh, Owen, th th this has been fascinating to me to, to hear what you, you've uh, thought about uh, and the challenges that you've met, I think we need to allow a little time for Q&A at this point. So why don't we turn over to Isaac Lehman? Great. Um, yes, thank you, Adela and Bob, for a very stimulating conversation. There, uh, there have been a number of questions that have come in. And I hope that if you didn't hear the announcement at the beginning, you're welcome to write a question in the Q&A, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to ask a question of my own, which is less about the process of, well, it's about the process of translating, but also about the reception and the audiences of translations. Um, and the question goes to both speakers. So the question is, what role did the future or imagined audiences play in your approach to uh, translating Harry Potter into Yiddish on the one hand and retranslating the Hebrew Bible into English on the other hand? Um, there's been great, Adela, as you know, there's been great popular interest um, in the publication of Harry Potter among the broader non-Yiddish speaking, non-Yiddish reading um, Jewish community. And I wonder if that played any role in your, in how you approach translation. And of course, um, uh, Professor Alter's new translation has also been very well received, um, not just by those who would appreciate it as a literary object, but also potentially as a source of religious meaning. And I wonder how, how the future or imagined audience uh, affected your translation choices and your overall approach. 
Why don't you start, Aaron? Uh, I think the most uh, the most salient uh, thing that comes to mind when we ask this question is um, I very selfishly was doing this translation uh, you know, for myself and uh, my uh, real or imagined progeny at the time, um, and so uh, you know I I was doing it in the 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 dialect. Um, and, and more specifically, the orthography, which is familiar to me, which uh, may have seemed controversial, controversial to some who prefer uh, a, a system of writing other than the EVO system. Um, but I also knew that there were going to be a lot of students and beginners uh, who were going to be reading the text, uh, since so many in the Yiddish community are in, uh, have, have come to the language as adults. Um, and I, I was really trying to strike a balance between uh, keeping the text readable um, and keeping it such that somebody would be able to uh, read it if they had access to a dictionary. They, they would be able to look up all the words that they needed and the words that aren't in the dictionary, they would be able to access in a glossary published on the publisher's uh, website. Um, but at the same time, I also was very careful to um, employ the, uh, the Yiddish specific syntax and idiom, um, which a native English speaker might not necessarily think of. So for example, you know, an English speaker uh, is used to saying, I like that, um, they, or I love that. They might be uh, moved to say, uh, I, I, I like that. But there's so many other ways to say I like that, you know, which either use a dative construction or which use something else which is entirely idiomatic. Um, and so that definitely informed a lot of um, my, uh, a, a lot of uh, word choice and, and the style as well. Now, in my case, I wasn't thinking much about an audience at all, because my primary focus was on these books, many of which, not all, uh, exhibit a, a, an astonishing literary style, subtle and deft, and in the poetry, sometimes very powerful. And I wanted to try to get that into English. So if I thought about an audience at all, I thought, well, you know, literary people who want to get closer to the literary uh, effects uh, of the Hebrew Bible will be drawn to this. Now, the response took me by surprise because uh, I got a spate of um, emails uh, for a long time. They've kind of slowed down now. Well, I still get them from time to time from religious people religious people of all stripes, modern Orthodox Jews, uh, a Presbyterian organist, uh, several uh, Baptist ministers, uh, an Episcopalian nun, and so on and so forth. And uh, they all were fantastically enthusiastic about the translation. And that made me think that sometimes the translation does what the translator did not intend. That is, I, I wasn't really trying to make this a, a more spiritual or more uh, religiously edifying set of texts, but by getting at, at the um, concreteness, the vividness, the literary power uh, of the Hebrew, a little bit more than my predecessors had, it ended up speaking to many um, religious people. Uh, I mean, the, the Episcopal nun, this was a few years ago, wrote to me that, that your, your translation of Psalms uh, changed my spiritual practice. <laughs> and that made my head spin. Okay, great. So different approaches. Um, let me just, I'll, I'll read some of the questions and I'll try to maybe um, group them together in a, in a logical way. So one question here comes from Jordan Brown. It says, Shkoya for a fine talk. Can you please speak a bit more about the Bava Buch as a basis for the translation of non-Jewish epic popular literature? It seems you play a similar game of sometimes far Yiddishing the characters and setting and sometimes not. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, sh I should say that I have not uh, read the Bubba book uh, 
beyond a few small excerpts. Um, but from what I understand, uh, the, the uh, translator, or perhaps more aptly put, the adapter into Yiddish uh, was, was quite, quite creative um, in really explicitly Judaizing a lot of the characters and the practices that were done to make them feel more familiar to the intended Jewish audience. Um, that was uh, markedly not the approach that I wanted to take. Um, I, I, did, uh, I did try to superimpose uh, Jewish frames of reference in places that made sense, um, but I, I was very careful not to, uh, not to tamper with any of the, the inherently Christian elements um, and certainly not to change the names of people. Um, I, 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 even going as far as to make sure not to translate Sirius Black's name as Sirius Schwartz, um, because I mean, if you met a Sirius Schwartz, he'd obviously be Jewish, right? Um, and uh, aside from the fact that if you keep his name as Black, uh, then you have the option of using various Yiddish idioms that, uh, that use the word Schwartz um, to kind of interplay with, with the way that he uh, interacts with other characters. So I wanted to keep that option uh, open. So uh, I, I'd like to say I, I was not uh, as creative as, as that uh, adapter or translator. Um, and it's probably for the best because I think uh, Rowling's agency would probably come after me if I did too much Judaizing. Yeah, great. I have a series of questions that are essentially, um, how do you say this in Yiddish? One of them is, I'll just, maybe we'll rattle off a few and then I'll get to the longer questions. Um, deluminator. Oh, okay, Deluminator. Um, Pop uh, quiz. Lesh Leshetl. So Leshen means to extinguish. Uh, Leshev is that which extinguishes and a Leshetl is a little extinguisher. So that's, that's your Deluminator. Okay, great. Parcel tongue. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I have oh, to do it, okay. which I am sort of in the middle of. Um, I'm not sure. Schlangensprach seems a little bit too obvious and a little too much of a mouthful, so we'll have to think about it. Okay, here, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> another question is, have you uh, connected with anyone who translated Harry Potter into Hebrew? And maybe we can extend that question. Did you ever consult other translations of Harry Potter in the process of rendering Harry Potter into Yiddish? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I was in touch with the um, Hawaiian translator and the translator into Scots English, um, not to consult their translations and their approaches to particular items, but more from the perspective of, uh, as somebody who's, who speaks a minority language, uh, what, was the, what was the reception, what was the process, and what was the what was the meaning of this translation for your community um, as a way to sort of yeah figure out what that reception uh, could or should uh, look like and, and what the audience might want? Um, I actually purposely uh, did not. Uh, I, I tried to avoid um, consulting the translations themselves while I was working, uh, unless I had a very specific question about a particular term, um, because I knew that my uh, my, my frame of reference for the tone that I wanted to strike in Yiddish and uh, the way I wanted to do things, uh, I knew that it was, uh, it, it was a delicate balance um, to strike and trying to, in trying to um, in, yeah, in, in trying to balance native Yiddish idiom with the tone that I wanted to strike from the original. And I was afraid that if I looked too closely at the other translations, I would be um, too influenced. Um, so I, I have read many of them in translation, but uh, already a year before I got started on the translation, I stopped. Um, but I am, I am also in touch with the translator of the Hebrew. Um, there's a lot of excellent translations out there. I just can't read them uh, because it would totally mess up my translation process, which I think is the opposite of Professor Alder. <laughs> okay, great. There are a few questions that are about your future plans. One is, any thoughts of turning a version into a stage production? I don't know if it would be allowed, but interesting question. Um, and the second is, will the rest of the series be translated? Uh, there is no stage production, although uh, I, I did modify uh, part of chapter uh, six for, uh, for a dramatic reading for the students of the EVO summer program, uh, which uh, Isaac, you were also present at. Um, but, um, 
there, I, I have recorded the first chapter um, as a sort of prelude to an audio book. Um, and uh, you can get that on YouTube. So if you just search Harry Potter. Um, I'm gonna right. paste the links into the chat. Awesome. Um, and also the link to buy the book. Thank you. So you can hear the first chapter and you can um, hear the various dialects uh, or my attempt at rendering the various dialects. Um, the problem with Harry Potter is uh, that the books get longer and longer and longer and the style gets more and more um, mature uh, and complex. And so I, I don't know what that says for my likelihood of completing anything beyond uh, book three or even book two. Right now I'm in the middle of book two. So uh, as we say in Yiddish, Lamedash de Leighton. I want to live to see the second book come out and then we'll see what happens after that. Well, I have to say that that, that corresponds to my experience. That is, first I was just going to do Genesis uh, as an experiment. And then it was quite well received. So I mean, I'll do one more book. And one book led to the next, to the third, and I kept, when my um, editor, very smart guy at Norton said to me, well, Bob, what we'd love you to do is the whole Hebrew Bible. I said, give me a break. Uh, and, uh, but then, and had I thought about doing the whole ball of wax, it would have been too intimidating. But after working on it for quite a few years on and off while I did other things, I said, hey, I've done almost two thirds. I can really get to the end. So maybe that will happen with you, uh, Arlen. Thank you. Yeah, Isaac, when you said that, uh, that Robert has, uh, has published 24 books, I thought it's gotta be more than 24. <laughs> the Bible has 24 books, right? Right. No, it is actually a little <laughs> more than 24. <laughs> yeah, so those were encountered in that, in that way. Um, Okay, there's another question here. Um, Nathan Levine writes, I'm reading Harry Potter and the Philosophische Stein and loving it, a grace and dank. I noticed that in chapter three, when Uncle Vernon is nailing the doors of the Dursley house shut, he is humming, not tiptoe through the tulips, but Hobbecha por Oxen, a Yiddish children's song without any tulips. What considerations are involved when, when adapting English folk culture to uh, Yiddishkeit in your translation, and how often did this come up? Uh, that's fair. Okay, yeah. So you, you you caught one of the few examples where, um, I mean, I didn't know the song "Tiptoe Through the, Through the Tulips." I, I had to go on YouTube and find out what the song is. It's really a very strange song, but I guess <laughs> I guess it's appropriate for Uncle Vernon uh, in his in his uh, craze to seal the house from the letters from Hogwarts. Uh, I suppose it's appropriate. Um, I, uh, once I learned what this song was and I thought, okay, how do I translate this into Yiddish? Um, I, I, I couldn't, I knew that no matter how I translated it, the readers in the Yiddish would say, well, what in the world is this? Is this a Yiddish song? I, I don't know what this is. Um, yeah, I, I don't even know. Gain of the Spitzfinger, then of the Tulpanen or something like that, which of course is already quite unwieldy. And so in that case, I really felt like my hand was forced um, and I had to pick some other uh, song which would be absurd for a grown man to be humming under his breath. Uh, so there, there actually were not very many opportunities for that. And the reason is that uh, typical English uh, folk culture uh, is not really well represented. You, you see it in the world of the muggles, but Harry very soon leaves that world and enters this fantasy world where everything is new um, and everything is foreign and, and magical and fantastical. Um, and so those, those translations uh, then one really has no choice because these are these are not even terms that exist in uh, in English or American culture. Okay, great. Um, there's a lot of questions. I'll, I'll just read off a few more. Um, one of them has to do with the way that Harry Potter characterizes or categorizes people. Um, how did you decide to distinguish between wizards and muggles and maybe some of the other more derogatory terms in the book? Uh, well, as of, as of book one, um, the only terms that one really comes across are, uh, are muggle and, and wizard. So, you know, wizard is just a kishif macher, 
and a muggle is a, a muggle. That, that seemed appropriate. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to do muggle because it reminded me too much of Gogo Muggle, that sort of egg creamy drink. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I, I didn't really distinguish in terms of the characters themselves. I think what's more, much more interesting uh, when, uh, when comparing the, the muggles and the, the wizards in book one is that uh, the muggles, the, the muggle family that Harry comes from is not a particularly friendly one. So uh, that's, I think the much more salient contrast. Um, but uh, the one word that I, I have been playing with for the second book, um, I haven't come across mudblood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is a very derogatory term. Um, but the one term that I, that I have settled on is the word for, oh goodness, what is the word for a wizard who can't do magic? Oh no. I don't remember. You've reached the limits of my trivia too. It's, uh, it's what Filch is. Um, anyway, the, it, it's, it, the, it is a person who is unable to do magic, but as a wizard. Um, so I came up with um, uh, a, a Zoibenechts, uh, which is a play on a Teugenich, which is somebody who, who's a really a good for nothing, and a Teugenich is a, a, a magicer for nothing. Um, and I, I feel really silly that I can't remember the word in. Uh, somebody wrote squib. Oh, Kimmy oh, wrote yes, squib. A squib, a squib, that's right. Teugenich. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, how did you translate spells and deal with, uh, or maybe incorporate their Latin or Greek roots, if at all, such as Wingardium Leviosa? Oh, this is quite interesting. Um, Yiddish as a, as a language um, that has incorporated many internationalisms and words of Latin and Greek origin. Um, I think these spells for the most part don't require much, um, don't require much transformation uh, in order to work in Yiddish. So Vingadium Leviosa makes sense. Locomotor Mortis makes sense. In later books, there are spells like Ridiculous, and uh, Expelliarmus, which is the, uh, the disarming spell, um, which of course uh, rely on English wordplay. So I'll, I'll have to figure something else out there. Um, Avada Kedavra is often um, attributed to, the, to one of a number of Aramaic phrases, perhaps uh, Avada Kedavra, um, or uh, it's the same thing. Um, but I, I, I chose to keep it in its uh, more opaque form as it, as it appears in the original. Uh, because bringing in something in Aramaic for no reason, um, just because it might come from Aramaic, uh, I don't know, it, it didn't feel true to the original. No. I'm sorry. And actually somebody asked about Abracadabra, so that's great. Um, maybe we'll just, we'll finish with one question. Um, somebody asked if the program is being recorded. It is being recorded and it will be in the, uh, on the YouTube channel of the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, the last question is kind of a bigger one. Um, Beyond language acquisition, is there a larger purpose, uh, a Yiddishist program for today's world? And if so, how do you and your book fit into it? Oof, okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, well, for, for those who, um, who will, it, will insist on not seeing any value in, in Yiddish and Yiddish culture, um, as, as a, a critical part of the Jewish experience, I'm probably not going to convince you of anything. Um, but uh, I, I think that uh, Yiddish, especially for those of us who have uh, Ashkenazi Yiddish heritage, uh, I think that there is something uh, quite important to under, understanding ourselves um, as Jews and, and for the Yiddish language as a, as a mode of, of expression and uh, a container for the human experience which uh, gives, gives us access to worlds which we didn't know were available to us. Um, and I think there's perhaps something ironic in rendering uh, something like Harry Potter, which uh, describes a world which, it, it, it never existed and it never will exist. It's complete fantasy. And yet uh, many modern Jews uh, in many ways feel uh, like the world of Harry Potter is more familiar to them um, than the world of their uh, more recent ancestors. Um, and that's troubling, although I suppose understanding given, given the traumas of, uh, uh, of genocide and, and simply of immigration. So, I mean, this is really quite a heavy topic, um, but I, I hope that Harry Potter, for, for those who are not, um, who are not 
con convinced, uh, I suppose, on the face of it by the value of Yiddish culture, um, can see in Harry Potter and Yiddish an entree into that world of Yiddish um, and, and really feel uh, bechesh, to, to feel um, in, in their deepest selves that uh, Yiddish is, is, uh, is something that has quite a lot to offer to us, not in competition with Hebrew or, or, or with Israel um, or, or with our American identities, but um, as an additive or, or multiplicative sense. Okay, great. That was a very nice answer. Um, so that's the end of the event. Um, do feel free to, I mean, look, look for the link when it comes out and send it to your friends. And again, if you want to purchase a copy of the book, I've pasted the link um, to order it in the chat. Thank you to Adela and Robert Alter for the conversation this late afternoon. And I hope we'll see you at a future program. Well, thanks for everyone. And thanks for Aaron for a fascinating talk. I have to run downstairs. Thank you so much. Isaac, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, and thank you uh, to, uh, to Berkeley as well for having me. Uh, I'm, this was uh, a real honor. And uh, thank you.